Are eyebrows considered facial hair? I've always wondered, do vegetarians eat animal crackers? If a number two pencil's so popular, why is it still number two? Do bald people get dandruff? Why are power outages reported on TV? That makes no sense. But some questions are more meaningful than others. How do I handle all the stress in my life? How do I discover God's will for my life and live it out every day? I have a hard time dealing with disappointment. What does the Bible say I should do? How can I be the parent my kids need me to be and the one God wants me to be? What does the Bible say about dealing with difficult people? Because I know some. Are we actually living in the end times? What does that mean for me? So we turn to the one who has all the answers. We'll examine some of our biggest questions and discover God's best plan. Why? Because you asked for it. All right, we are in our fifth week called You Asked For It. And it, what basically, why, what is it all about? If it's your first time here today, I'll explain what happens. Uh, if people come to church, uh, probably about 60% of the people um, don't come, uh, come to church weekly. About 40% are not here that normally call Cornerstone Church their church. And so Easter is a great opportunity when everyone comes out on Easter Everyone comes out, and we had over 700 people we gave a survey to, gave them an opportunity to respond to it during Easter. And we had a little survey, asked certain questions, and one of the things we asked is, what are some topics you would like to hear about? And so what you all did, many of you did that were here, is you filled out the topics you were interested in hearing about. And the ones we did so far, uh, we're doing them in order of the survey. The first one was, how do I deal with stress? The second one was, second week is, how do I find my purpose in life? Third one was, how do I change? Uh, the fourth one was, how do I really forgive other people and myself? That was last week. Uh, you can catch up at cornerstonecheshire.com and find out what it's all about and catch up on the messages there. Today is a very, I think, a very great question. How do I find God's will for my life? What a great question. How do I find God's will for my life? And, and I really can appreciate that because I went through that process in my early 20s where I didn't know what God wanted. I didn't know if God existed for a period of time. Didn't know what I was supposed to do with my life, and I went through a lot of struggle, and I thank God for it. And so today, I'm going to share with you some things in the Bible that talk about how we find our will. And maybe you're going through some transitions. Perhaps you're, you're uh, coming close to retirement. You're like, now what? Maybe the kids have left. You're an empty nest. Maybe you're going to go to college next year. Um, I don't know. Maybe you just got out of a her terrible divorce, and you're like, God, what's next for me? I don't know what's going to happen. My life's been shattered. Um, I'm just getting through bankruptcy. Whatever you've been through, uh, what? How can you find God's will and know what to do? And the good news is this. God desires more to show you his will for your life than you do to know it. Let me say that again. God desires to show you his will for your life more than you desire to know it yourself. Then you're saying, well, if that be the case, why is it so difficult for me to hear God's voice? And maybe you're like me. You know some people that always hear God's voice. You know the people that always say, oh, God told me this. God told me to buy the car. God told me to sell the car. God told me, and I, I, I don't know, if God was that way, he'd be changing his mind all the time. And I've also learned that when people say, I do believe God speaks, I have no doubt about it, but we gotta be careful. People just throw that word around, God told me, and the Bible says, 10 commandments, do not take the Lord's name in vain. And I think a lot of people take his name in vain. And I'm very careful before I say God said, uh, because it's hard, kind of hard to argue with God. So someone, well, God told me so, really? I had a friend of mine that just went through this situation, uh, a prominent pastor, and, and someone, his assistant said, well, God told me to do this. Well, God didn't tell me, and I'm your superior, so sit down. <laughs> so sometimes it's interesting how people throw that around to manipulate people, and that's not what it's about. Really what it's about, what does God want for me? What does God want my life to be about? And today I'm going to share with you some things the Bible talks about and how you and I, I believe, by the time we leave here today, this is real practical, some practical, pragmatic things that you and I can do to hear and understand what God's voice is about that. Like, for example, I remember being a little kid. Uh, do I want to get the Star Wars toy or do I want to get the $6 million dollar man doll? I, I couldn't decide which one I wanted to get. And that was a real dilemma back in the I, I chose the $6 million dollar man. Uh, <laughs> or later on, you start wondering, should I play soccer or baseball or lacrosse? Or should I go on the spelling bee team? Or should I, you know, whatever should I do? Yeah, I, spelling bee team, that's a lot of fun. Um, <laughs> later on, we, we find out as you're graduating high school, do I want to um, go into a career path? and just get out there and work? Or should I go to college? Should I go to community college? Or should I go to a state school? What, what should I do? I don't know what college to go to. 
Um, should I take a year off and work? Should I go into debt? And you, all these questions, right? And you get to college, and like, what's my major? What should my major be? Um, and then after that, you figure out, uh, okay, how do I pay my bills? Uh, should I marry this person or not? Is this the right one, God? Uh, which job should I take? You get out of college, you try to find a job, and then you, you, you get married maybe, or maybe you don't get married. Should I get married? Should I be single? Or, or God, are you calling me to be married? What, what should I do? And I remember being in my early 20s, and I did not like going to family gatherings and parties because people would ask me a million questions. Oh, so what are you doing now? I'm talking to you. Don't really want to, but I know. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? You ever been to that experience where you're going through a transition? Maybe you got out of a horrible divorce. Maybe something happened bad in your life. Maybe you got out of school. You don't know what God's calling you to do next. And you just don't, you hate when people ask you, oh, so what's your plans? And you almost avoid those parties. And those things, because it's painful not to know. And you're like, God, why didn't you tell me what I'm supposed to do with my life? You just tell me, I'll do it. And it's like, like God, where are you? Meanwhile, everyone else seems to be hearing from God. In fact, one of the myths is this. There's a myth that God only speaks to the spiritual people and the real ones that he don't talk to. That's not true. God speaks to everyone if they will listen. In fact, God's speaking right now. I believe it. But we have to train our ears to hear it. So I'm going to share with you some things that are going to help with that. Now, how about this? I remember when we first got married. Should we have kids now or not? And I was like, mm -mm, no kids. No, this is great. I love getting, you know, I, I, I really, I, I had no interest in having kids. Zero. And one day I was having my devotions, I was reading the Bible. I felt like God said, now's the time. And immediately my heart switched. It went from not wanting to have any kids at all to wanting to have kids. I remember another time that I was praying about the church and people were saying, we should build. I'm, like, no, I'm not going to do that. That's a headache. I can ask people for money. I hate asking people for money. We're fine the way it is. I had no desire. And one day I was praying and reading the Bible and all of a sudden I heard the voice, God, it's time to build. So it's amazing how God will direct you as you spend time with him, which I already stole one of the points ahead of time. But God desires to speak to us. He really wants to speak to us. He's a father, and a father wants to talk to his children. And so let's go ahead and look at this and how God can speak to you. And, and I want to let you know that no, there are not cer certain select people that hear from God, and you can't. It's for everybody. You know, one of the things you can tell a cult or a cultist Christian group is when a certain group says, we have the secret knowledge. We, we know how to get a hold of God. Those other churches, we are the ones that hear from God. And then also you have the people that hear from God. Listen, I, no mistake, there are people that, that God gifts in the body of Christ. But God never did things exclusively. He was very inclusive. He invited all those who can come. The, the word of God is not hidden. It's right there in front of you. And God desires to speak to every single person. I'm convinced of that. And so we're not interested in having a select group of people that only can hear from God. Our desire is to help you all to hear from God because we believe you can. We believe you can. That's one of the rights you have. And one of the major verses in Christianity is this, my sheep know my voice. And I've, talk, I've read about shepherds, and I've talked about what happens to these shepherds. I, talked about, I read about a shepherd. I even talked to a shepherd one time about it. And what happens is, I heard the story about a bunch of shepherds are together and uh, different flocks. And what they do, they let, their, they let their flocks go ahead and eat the grass out there. They're all kind of mixed around. And what happens is, uh, it's amazing. Someone said, well, how, do you, how can you get your sheep? They're all mixed in. Don't worry about it. Watch this. He said, why don't you call my sheep? Huh? So the guy tries to call the sheep. Nothing happens. He goes, Whew. all he does is just a little quick whistle. Come. And immediately, about 45 to 50 sheep just come, and they separate themselves from the rest of the different sheep because sheep know their master's voice. So very vivid. And Jesus says, my sheep know my voice. You're like, well, I don't know his voice. I don't know his voice. I think part of the reason why, we have this romantic um, Hollywood view of God that if God speaks, there's going to be some violin score playing, and there's going to be some light, and it looks like the touch by, remember the touch by the angel, they used to have the, the backlighting on the person, it would come up, and oh, this is called speaking. Often God speaks in the still, small, quiet voice. We're expecting this big trumpet to sound. God speaks all the time. And he desires for you and I to know his will for your life. I'm absolutely positively convinced of that, because the Bible says so. And so, let's... Let's look at it. I remember one time saying, God, what should I do? What should I do, God? I, I, I actually did this. I call it the spin and point method. Spin my Bible like this. 
It's almost like going to you know, Wheel of Fortune with Vanna White or something. You just spin it around. Okay, God, what should I do about the situation with my, with my family? Should I, should I do this or not? And I'll point at it. And sometimes it worked pretty good. Anyhow, that's how I met Sandra. Mary sent. No, that didn't happen. That did not happen. That did not happen. That did not happen. I did marry Sandra, and thank God for that. But uh, I heard of a person doing that, and, and they, they were going like this, and they pointed to the Bible, and they opened the passage and said this. It says, um, then Hanan took David's servants, shaved off, off their beards, cut off their garments in the middle at their buttocks, and sent them away. And then he goes like this. Okay, God, I don't like that one. <laughs> Go and do likewise, says Jesus. So that's not a good way to hear God's voice. I do not recommend it. And you're laughing because many of you that laughed have done it. Those who laughed did it. Those who didn't laugh are like, huh? Okay, so if your neighbor laughed, they're the ones that do that. So anyhow, so what's the story with that? How can we know that? Jesus says, my sheep know my voice, and he desires to speak to you, and he wants to. So what is God's will for your life? I know a lot of people, and myself included, have been guilty of this. Oh, I'm going to do this. We're going to build this, do this, and the other. I'm going to go to this college. I'm going to do this. I'm going to start a business here. We're going to do this and this. And we say, okay, God, thanks so much. Now, God, would you do me a favor? Would you please put your good housekeeping seal of Holy Spirit's uh, uh, approval on me right now? I, I just decided what I want to do in my life now. Will you please come and do this now? I want to buy this car. Uh, I, I remember when I first got, a, got out of school, I wanted to buy a car. I wanted to buy a Mustang GT. And then, I didn't buy a Mustang GT. I bought a Ford Escort GT. <laughs> Big difference. But I remember trying to say, oh, I, I need to get this. Uh, S I need to get the. Um, I need to get the Mustang GT because, after all, you have to move out in power. And I, I, know, I know God wants me to be happy. And I tried to justify it, and I ended up buying an Escort GT. Okay, which is like poor excuse for a GT. Uh, but I remember trying to, to manipulate. Or there's been circumstances in my life where I wanted God to say it's okay. And so I won't get close to God, but I just say, come on, God, bless it. And it doesn't work too well, folks. How do we hear God's voice, and what is God's will? I want to ask, first, first of all, to open to James 4, 13 through 17. The Bible has something to say about folks, and it says this. Come now, you who say, today or tomorrow, we will go out to such and such a city, spend a year there, buy and sell and make a profit. And there's nothing wrong with doing that. Let's continue on with the Scripture. Whereas you do not know what will happen tomorrow. For what is your life? What is your life? It is even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. Go ahead. Instead, and you thought I memorized that, didn't you? Okay. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we shall do this or that. So many people just have ideas. I'm going to do this, this, and the other. We should always be at the point of saying, if God wills it. If God wills this to happen, if God wills, I will retire and I will move to Canada and then I'll go to Calcutta and I'll give Natasha $100,000 to build a shelter. If so, Lord wills it. Natasha goes, that's God's will. Um, <laughs> she, 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 heard from, she heard from God already. So if that's you, praise God, you now have your answer. But uh, what's God's will? We often just make these assumptions and we just make our plans. We should be asking, God, is this what you want me to do? Now, I heard, you know, that's, is that what God wants us to do? Yes, God wants us to ask. He wants us to rely upon him. Well, how do we do that? Well, first of all, this life is like a mist. This life is very quick. It comes and goes. The Bible says in 1 John 2, 17, the world is passing away and the lust of it, but he who does the will of God abides forever. How do I know God's will? Let me give you some basic theological seminary 101 class that I learned many years ago. How to find out God's will. Well, the first of all, don't go to sleep on me here. I'm going to give you some theological points, and then we'll get to practical steps that you can take home and use today. The first thing is like, something to call the sovereign will of God. There's the sovereign will of God, which means God is going to do what God is going to do. He's going to come back. He's going to judge the world. He's going to do what he's going to do. There's some sovereign will of God. And one of the sovereign wills of God is the Great Commission, which basically says, go into all the earth, preaching the gospel to all creation. And lo, I'm with you to the end of the age. That, that's, that's God's sovereign will. There's no doubt about it. That's his will. His will is for us to go around the world to spread the gospel. That's his will. His will is that none should perish, but all should be saved. That's his will. That's what he wants to happen. It's his sovereign will. God is going to come back one day. You cannot, dis, you cannot change God's sovereign will. It's what he's going to do. So you need to know God's sovereign will. That's the first thing. 
That's why it's good to read the Bible to figure that out. The second thing is, is um, the moral will of God. This is like what God says about certain things. Like, for example, forgive others as you want God to forgive you. Uh, do be not stingy, things of that nature, and do not, uh, do not be angry let, lest the enemy will open a doorway in your life. The Bible says, oh, do not be angry, but do not sin. So the Bible has moral law. Be honest and give an honest day wage, and talks about all these things in the scriptures. Show respect to, to proper authorities. So clearly the Bible talks about um, the moral will of God which we'll get into a little bit later on, more. So what God has already said in his word, that's called the moral. So we have the sovereign will of God. He's going to do what he's going to do. Yeah, the moral will of God. This is the right way and the wrong way of doing things that's found in the Bible. And by the way, the reason why God says these things is not to curtail our fun. It's to make our life better because he's our designer. He's our maker. He knows what works and what doesn't work. And he wants to see you and I flourish. He wants to see you do well. And that's why these rules are there for your own good. I know sometimes the church makes it sound like they're upset that you're having fun. No, it's not about that. God wants you to have life and life abundantly, and this is why he tells us to do certain things and not do certain things. So you have the moral will of God. So you have the sovereign will of God, the moral will of God, and then through that you have the personal view of God. I like what Chris Hodges had to say about this, and I'm taking it from him. He talked about golf, which I tried to do, and I'm, I'm thinking about trying again. But he talked about that learning God's will is very much like golf. And the fact that there is the fairway. And what the fairway is, it's an area where the grass is nice and short. And if you hit the ball and you keep the ball within that fairway, it's a whole lot easier to get to the green and get the ball into the hole. Now, if you get hit out of the fairway and you get to something called the rough, and that's where they grow the grass taller, and you get in that rough, it's hard to get that ball out of that grass back onto the fairway. When it's on the fairway, it's a lot easier to move forward with the goal and the purpose of getting that thing into a little hole, okay? And so that's what happens. And so there's, there's, there's traps, there's uh, rocks, there's little moats, and what have you, and so the objective is to get in the fairway. Well, this is what happens. When you know God's sovereign will, will his moral will, that kind of lines it up and really takes a lot of not knowing what to do, makes it a lot clearer. It's very much like doing a puzzle. Well, you know the basic square. Once you get the outline of the puzzle, you're doing pretty good, right? You know that, you get that, cool. Now I can work within these parameters. And so what happens is we know the moral will of God, and you know the sovereign will of God, it makes it easier to hit the ball in the fairway. Otherwise, you're going to be way off and not even be close to doing it. So God has graciously given us much to know already. That's the beautiful part of it. Now, what about the personal will of God? I want to know that. I understand. But the only way you're going to know the personal will of God, you've got to first know the moral, and you've got to know the sovereign will of God. This is why we meet together partially, okay? So God desires things for your life. The more I get to know the sovereign will of God and the moral will of God, the clearer my personal view will be. That's why I spend a lot of time in here. I want to share with you something that will save you so much trouble. Uh, if you're like me, do you ever get irritated with people? Am I the only one? Do people ever bother you? Okay, I've noticed this. Every time I get upset, which is very rare, but if I get upset, if I get upset, I used to just react. Now I stop and say, wait a minute, okay, God, uh, I'm irritated with this set of circumstances or this person. Why am I irritated with this? Is this because of my own pride? Is it because you're being compromised? Is it because people are not honoring? And I'll ask God that question before I, and then he goes, well, to be, be truthful with you, you ha, you're kind of insecure in this area. You want people to recognize who you are, and you feel kind of slighted. And you're not really interested about me. You're interested about yourself looking good. Ah, okay, God, I'm sorry. And then I'll get right with God, and then all of a sudden that upsetness kind of dissipates. And then I can actually view a person and talk to a person in a much better way. Guys, listen, when you get upset, it's a blessing. Ask God, if you're a believer, ask God, God, why is this bothering me? Why do what my husband said is bothering me so much? Why do what my, my, my wife said or my boss said or my child said? Ask yourself the question. And that's so important to do. You ask yourself the question. And so that's all part of knowing the will of God. So what's the first thing we need to do to, in order to hear God's voice? Well, the first thing we have to do is this. We know the theological truth, but now we'll get right down to it. The first thing's important is this. Have, number one is this. You want to take notes? You write this down. Number one, have a right 
relationship with God. No kidding. Well, I'm telling you, if you want to know God's will, you have to have a right relationship with him. Well, how do you have a right relationship? What's that all about? Well, very clear. Romans uh, 12 and verse 2 says the following. It says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is good and acceptable and the perfect will of God. So having a right relationship with God is knowing him. I'm going to tell you something that's so simple and so, uh, it's almost like insulting. And, and a lot of people do not do this. It's so insulting. I'll tell you what, if you want to grow in God, I talked about forgiving, but another thing very important is get into the word of God. Reading the Word of God will help clarify and bring you into focus. It's like having a pair of binoculars and hitting that center thing where you're trying to get focused, that when you read the Bible, all of a sudden the focus starts coming in. And I have found when I'm spending my personal time with God, not trying to find a message for you all or trying to find, I just do it just to get with God. All of a sudden, everything gets clearer to me because the Word of God, what happens with the Word of God is you know God by reading His Word. What happens is very simple. I'm reading the Word of God. It says, be anxious for nothing, but with everything in prayer and, and supplication, make your request known to God. And all of a sudden, the Bible says, you've been anxious about this and the other. And I'll hear the passage of Scripture speak to me. I don't hear voices, per se, but I hear something inside of me. All right? And, and what, what that is, that's the voice of the Holy Spirit speaking. So the more familiar you get with the Bible, the more you hear God's voice. The more you hear God's voice, you begin to discern which of yours, which of the world, and what's of the enemy. And so there's no substitute for spending time in the Word. It's not like, you better read the Bible. You know, it's not about that, okay? It's not about that. It's about you get to spend time with God and to hear about His voice. I mean, there's nothing better. It's awesome. That's why we encourage you every day to get into His Word. It's so important. So you get hearing His voice by the, voice, by the, by the Bible. So important. So that's a, I'm going to write relationship with God, number one. Number two is this. What does the Bible say, I just said it. What does the Bible say about this? The Bible says the following. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will no means pass away. The Bible is very clear about that, right? The Word of God goes on forever. Society changes, things change. And for example, uh, one of the biggest things going on in our, in our culture today, the Bible says there should be no hint of sexual immorality among you. The Bible says that. Do not be involved with sexual immorality, which actually the word is pornea. All right, and so by, you know, only appropriate place for sexual activity is between a husband and a wife that are married. That's simple. But our society says, wait a minute, no, we've evolved, and we've moved forward, and after all, that's ancient. No, the Bible's the Bible. The Bible says it. There should be no question about that area. You see, the Bible's very clear about that, isn't it? And so we should be living a life of purity. That's just an example. Um, talking about what's going on in our society today, there's a lot of talk about all these various things, and the Bible makes it very, very clear. And so that's right there. The Bible says that. What does the Bible say? The Bible says also, I love this, Hebrews 4.12, the Word of God is living. It's powerful. It's sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even the division of soul and spirit, of joints and marrow. Listen to this, a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. So many times the Bible will show me the state of my heart. And listen, I, I, I'm, I hope you understand this. I've learned not to trust myself apart from God. I trust myself when I'm in God. If I'm by myself, I don't trust God. In fact, let me say something. I don't believe in introspection anymore. I don't like it. When I introspect, either I get depressed or I get kind of prideful. Instead, I'd rather have spirit inspection. I'd rather say, come on, Holy Spirit, let's take a walk and look through my life. And he'll point out things through the Holy Spirit that I'll see that I need to change in my life. That's a lot better than saying, well, I should do this the other. Because God's never a God that cuts you down and beats you up. He always builds you up. He might beat you down to get your attention, but it's ultimately like a discipline so you can build you up. And so that's all part of it. So Hebrews talks about that. It says in Psalm 139, 23, it says the following, Search me, O God. Know my heart. Know my heart. Try me. And know my anxieties. Maybe some of you are anxious. I'm really worried what's going on. It was a while ago, I went up to pray for a couple days and to pray about the fall of next year. And I, I started getting overwhelmed. I started looking at the world condition. I started thinking about what's going on in the Middle East and Putin and, uh, and all this nonsense that's going on in the Middle East and how it's... You can see that what's going to happen to my children, God? What's going to happen if the economy goes bad? And I start thinking about all these things and my kids and the future. I start getting anxious. I'm like, I said, wait a minute, wait a minute. No, it's not my person. God, I'm sorry. I'm getting anxious. I'm worrying about the future because I'm reading all this 
times. Are we in the end times? Are we going to have to do this and the other? Do I need to buy a bunker? Do I need to buy a machine gun? You know, all that kind of stuff. I'm just joking with you. Uh, but, you know, you start worrying about all this stuff, right? And I said, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. What does the Bible say? Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow has enough evil of its own. And I thought thinking about that. And also, I said, you know, God, it's your responsibility to do that. I'm going to do what you told me to do. I'm going to do, I'm going to be the best dad I can be. I'm going to be the best pastor I can be. And I'm going to get involved in the community and be a blessing to everyone I can come in contact with. I'm going to listen to your voice. That's all you've called me to do. And you know what, guess what happened? That anxiety that was on me just poof, came off of me. That's the way to deal with it. The Bible says, know my anxious thoughts. See if there's any wicked way in me and lead me in the way of what? Everlasting. Do you see that everything about wickedness and all that, all that is not to steal your fun. It's to give you an everlasting and joyful life the way you're designed. So it's wonderful to ask the Holy Spirit. This is what I call God inspection. He says, search me, oh God. Don't say search yourself. Look within. Don't look within without God there. Look within only with God. And then you'll see areas that God will touch your life. So what does the Bible say? The first thing is, I'm in a right relationship. Number two, what does the Bible say? The third thing is this. I like this one. Remember WWJD? What would Jesus do? What would Jesus do at work? Well, I'm not Jesus. Uh, sometimes someone said to me one time, I said, well, you know what? I'm not Jesus. If they come over here, I'm going <laughs> to. So what would Jesus do? What a great way to look at it. And I love what it says in Philippians chapter, chapter 2. Have the same mind that which is in Christ, who did not regard equality with God something to be grasped, but emptied himself, becoming a servant. Have the same attitude of Christ. So is my attitude of being a servant? Or am I trying to prop myself up? I'm the pastor of the church. You need to submit to me. I don't know why I have a southern accent when I do that. But anyhow. <laughs> but, you know, that whole thing. And, and the Bible talks about it in James 3. And it says, that, but if you're bitterly jealous and there's selfish ambition in your heart, don't cover the truth with boasting and lying. For jealousy and selfishness are not God's kind of wisdom. And that's an example of living not like Christ. What would Jesus tell my wife? Would Jesus just come in and say, well, she's, ah, she's at home all day long, and I, you know, I worked hard. I, 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 I should be able to sit and watch Sports Center, and I want a prime rib. I want a prime rib, and I want her to put the slippers on my feet, and that woman better take care of me. No, I mean, that's, is that what Jesus would do? No, Jesus would do the dishes. Jesus would walk the dog if you have a dog. Jesus would get rid of the cat. Okay, I'm sorry. I have nothing wrong. I love cats. Only in Broadway. Okay, let's get moving on. Okay, uh, I know last week I started with the cats again. I'm sorry. They're God's creation. There's a reason why they're uh, for Halloween. Okay, number four. Number four. If you ever need to know to buy a dog or cat, go with the dog. Okay. <laughs> number four. I'm sorry. I gotta stop. She was saying, what kind of church is this that are against cats? <laughs> okay. Someone's like this. All right. Number four uh, is have I sought godly counsel? You know, the Bible, God purposely leaves things out of your life and my life. I don't have everything, you don't have everything. He wants us to work together as a team. You need a pitcher, you need a catcher, right? You need different positions, different parts of the body make the body function. And so what I have done, for example, when I felt the Lord say, it's time to get married, I talked to people that were married 60 years. Tell me, what made your marriage last 60 years? I spoke about that. Well, before I built the church here, I, I talked to friends that built churches. Hey, what have you, how did you build a church and how did you do it? Who'd you talk to? And I talked to people like that. Well, how did you, um, you know, how did you uh, get involved with this? And how did you find who to go with and which architect? And how did you raise money? Da, 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 da. I talked to people. I asked wise counsel. I, I talked to people that have a track record, that have uh, integrity, that are known to have integrity. I didn't ask a guy that's failing. I didn't ask a guy that's church is, is, is failing. And, he can, just, and I don't ask people that are not successful. I ask for people that are successful in doing what I think God's called me to do. There's nothing against anyone like that, but if you want to know how to have a better marriage, don't talk to somebody who's been through six marriages. It's not a good idea. They always have the answers. Go to a person that is humble, 
that it has a good marriage. Go to a person that is not struggling financially to ask him, what are you doing? I see you're prospering and I see you live frugal. Find wise counsel. Lord, what should I do about this? My kids are going to college or my kids are in high school. I'm a little concerned about that. Little Johnny is wanting to you know, do various things. How do I handle that? Talk to somebody that's raised kids that are doing well. Why? That's the beauty of small groups. You get to help each other out, encourage each other out, and help each other to walk this path. We're not called to walk this alone. Get godly counsel. The Bible says in Proverbs 11, 14, where there is no counsel, the people fail. But in the multitude of counselors, there is safety. There's times I listen to people and I go, mm, thank you, but I gotta make this decision. And that's the beauty of it. When I, before I married Sandra, I mean, I was really hesitant to get married. You know, I was very, very careful because I had a broken relationship in the past. I didn't want to do that again. But I, I sought people that I trusted. I asked my parents. I asked my, pa my, my former pastor. My parents said, no, I wouldn't have done it. And I don't make it you upset, but no. If my parents said, no, Eric, I don't think she's the right one for you. I really don't. I wouldn't have married Sandra. How can you say that? Well, first of all, my parents are, are trustworthy. They're wise. And I value, their, I value this. She'd be a great wife. We have utmost confidence in you marrying that girl. In fact, marry that. I had a missionary who used to say this. Marry that girl already. You know? And uh, Philip from India, he's now with the Lord. And, and so I asked, I asked my friends, what do you think? If, if everyone says no, it's probably, a, I don't trust myself completely because I don't see everything. I asked my parents, I asked my friends, you know, and, and as a result of that, and through the Bible, through experience, and of course, I love her as well, it was the right thing to do, right? Because I got wisdom about it. And that's all part of it. You saw, seek God counsel. So the first thing, have a right relationship with God. What does the Bible say? What would Jesus do? Have I sought wise counsel? These are just, and by the way, you don't just do one and the other. Do all of these together, and you'll get an answer. I guarantee you that. Or your money back. I'll even throw in a two extra knives. Have I sought God to counsel? Number five, am I trusting and obeying what I know? There's an old song. You might have sung it before. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus than to trust and obey. You say, I used to grow up with that song. It's so true. I trust and I obey. There's no other way to be happy in Jesus. We have to trust God and what he says. Am I trusting and obeying what God has said? Am I doing what I last told me? This is what I often learned. Don't doubt what God showed you in the light when you're in the dark. Whatever the last thing God told you to do, do it until he says something else. This is what I have found. I found if I'm faithful, if God's called you, for example, to move to the United States of America, and God's called you, right now you have a job at 7-Eleven, and you're working at 7-Eleven, because it rhymes with heaven. It's okay. So you're at 7-Eleven. You're working at 7-Eleven. You're coming to church. You're involved with a small group. You're working hard. And you're working unto God. No, just a lousy job. No, I'm going to act like I own the store. I'm going to treat it. I want to help the store succeed. You know what happens? All of a sudden, uh, a lucky break. They call it a lucky break. It's called being prepared meets an opportunity. God will meet you. If you're faithful in the little, you'll be faithful with much. If you're unfaithful with the little, don't wait for the big break, folks. Be, if, if all you're doing is, is you're working at McDonald's, if you're, working at, if you're working at Dunkin' Donuts, quit and go to Starbucks. But besides that, you, you got to be, be faithful where God has placed you, and God will award you for it. Be faithful. Am I doing the last thing God told me to do? And so I didn't know what the next thing was. What, what did God call me to do? God called me to pastor the church, to spend time in the Word every day. And, to do, and that's what I did every day. And while I was doing that, I got a word to start doing this, to build, right? When I was, when I was reading the Bible and praying, spend time with God, God said, it's time to have kids. Of course, my wife agreed, thank God. So that's all part of the process, trusting and obeying. What has God told you already? This is what John 14, 21 says. He who has my commandments and keeps them, it is he who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. Not because God is upset with us. He says, I will spend, if you, if you listen to what I say, I'll show you more. Come on, you, for those of you who are parents or guardians, you know what it's about. If your kids, they do what you ask them to do, do you not give them more favors? Right, they're showing responsibility, right? It'd be irresponsible for you to give your child a car if they're on the third speeding ticket right, and they're smoking up your tires, he probably would not 
unless you want to let, you know, you would not want that person to drive your car, right? That'd be irresponsible. That's how you're supposed to do it. Yes, I used to smoke tires. Okay, anyhow, let's go on. I never smoked cigarettes, but I did smoke tires. <laughs> Am I trusting and obeying what God last showed me? The Bible says this in Matthew 13, 14 through 16. And in them, the prophecy of Isaiah is fulfilled. Listen, this is kind of, which also says, hearing you will hear and shall not understand, and seeing you will see and not perceive. For the hearts of the people have grown dull. Their ears are hard of hearing, and their eyes have closed. Lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears. Lest they should turn and understand with their hearts and turn so that I would heal them. But blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. What is that supposed to mean? Well, there's other scriptures of this. Well, God will give you a revelation if you ignore God's revelation to you of what you're supposed to do. For example, forgive this person. And the God, Holy Spirit tells you that. You should, I will refuse to. You know what God will do? Okay. Have it your way. The Bible says something very, very, very scary. I think the most fearful passage in Scripture is Romans chapter 1. Although they knew God, they did not honor God or give thanks. So God gave them over to a reprobate mind. In other words, you're not going to listen to me? Have it your way. God gave them over. And see, what happens is if you don't listen to the revelation that God has given you, guess what's going to happen? You're going to lose hearing in the revelation of God. If you make a choice, I'm not going to listen to that. What happens, you make a little step like this. I'm not going to do that. And the next thing you know, you take these little steps. And instead of being over here, you're way over on the other side because you haven't listened to the revelation that God has given you. And eventually, you won't care anymore. And your heart will get hardened. And then you won't hear from God. I'm telling you, I've seen it happen in my own life. Well, I ignored God. I didn't listen to God. Thank God that he was gracious enough to rattle my cage and make me fall. And I'm glad he did. I'm glad I had a little bit of a crash to make me get my attention back. But my friends, it's a scary thing when God stops speaking to you. And that happens if you don't listen to the revelation you do have. Now we're going to go fast to the rest of it because that's a big one. That's a big point. I want to get past to you. So am I trusting and obeying what God do know? Number six, do I sense God's peace? First Corinthians, for God is not the author of confusion, but of peace. Now, I need to preface this a little bit because I've heard people say they have peace about things they should not have peace about. I just have peace. I know, I know, I know she's not my wife, and I know I had three kids at home, but I just believe God's called me to Hawaii to marry this girl I've never seen yet, but I just met her on the internet. I think God's called, I have peace about it. Really? Yeah. I think you must be smoking something because you know what? That's not God's will. So just because you have peace, peace, doesn't mean you're hearing God. Now, it's good to have God's peace, all right? That's cool. But the whole 60s was about peace. And look at the mess the peace got them into. We're not talking about this silly peace thing. We're talking about inward peace that God is with you. Now, let me, let me share with you a couple things. It doesn't mean there's no fear you have to battle. The reason why God told Joshua, fear not. I'm with you. Do not be afraid, because he was afraid. And sometimes when you're going to start something new, you're going to build a building, you're going to get married, you're going to have kids, there's a little trepidation there, but you know in your heart you have peace. It's the right thing to do, but you're a little nervous about it. You follow me? There's a difference. So you have to follow the peace of God, but make sure all the other seven things we're talking about line up. So do I sense God's peace? Number seven is this. It's the most important one, I think. Is it my will or God's? So many times I've lined it up the way I wanted to have. Okay, God, here it is. Give me the stamp of approval. Am I willing to walk away from the dream that God gave me? Am I willing to say, you know what? I worked all my life for this, this position. Am I willing to walk away and say, you know what? I'm just going to quit and I'm going to do something else. If God, well, Am I willing to do that? If I'm not willing to walk away from God's promises, Abraham had to kill his Isaac. He didn't kill Isaac, but he was willing to lay it down. Listen, that's, is it my will or God's? This is an amazing thing that happened to Jesus. Jesus, and, and towards the end of his life, he was called, obviously, to come to the planet, to show us the way, to die on the cross, to pay for the sins of all the world. If the world accepts Christ as their Lord and Savior, they can have fellowship with God. He knew his plan. He knew his purpose. He knew he had to be crucified. But he came to the end of his life. He's like, he comes, and looks, read, let's take a look at what Jesus went through in Matthew 26. Is it my will or God's? 
He went a little farther and he fell on his face. And the Bible says his sweat was like drops of blood. He was under such duress. He said, oh, my father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. God, if there's another way to save humanity without going to the cross, I am all ears. Father, please, and not, please, if there's a way out of this, but not my will, but your will be done. Like Esther, if I die, I die. I got to do the right thing. And so that's all part of it. Is it my will of God? I'm going to ask the worship team, at least Esteban, make his way up. We're almost, we're closing up here in a couple seconds. But even Jesus had to ask himself the question, is it my will or God's? If Jesus had to ask that question, do you not think maybe you and I have to ask that question? Yeah. The Bible says, I guess, it's, I guess I'm getting a sign from God, I need to end. <laughs> Luke 9, 23, then he said to him, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily and follow me. It's a daily thing. Listen, this is the good, this is the good part. Psalm 37, 23, the steps of a godly man or woman are ordered by God. There's a song I was going to sing, but I ran out of time. I was going through a situation and I read Psalm 25, 4 and 5. It just ministered to me. I'm going to read it to you. Show me your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth and teach me. For you are the God of my salvation, and on you I will wait all of the day. There's no reason why you and I can't find God's way. I encourage you to pay attention to God's sovereign word. Know his sovereign word. Know his moral word. And your personal word will get clearer. Do these seven things. And I guarantee you, you're going to hear God like you've never heard before because it's all of this together that works. You know what the Bible says? Luke 12, 31. But seek the kingdom of God, and all these things shall be added to you as well. I love this. Do not fear. Maybe some of you are fearing what's going to happen. I've talked to some people that are getting older, and they're, they're fearful that their spouse is going to die before they die, and what's going to happen to me, and are oh, the kids going to take care of me, I have to go to a nursing home, I'm worried about, I, I've, I've talked to people that struggle with this, it's a real fear. The Bible says, do not fear, little flock, for it's your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. My sheep hear my voice. I know them, and they follow me. Let me ask you a question. Do you know Jesus? You may know about him, but do you know Jesus? Do you? That's, that's how it works, folks. Let me tell you, Jesus is real. He died on the cross for our sins. You know it's true. You feel inside. You know it's, you, you sense it. But have you actually surrendered your life? Say, God, it's not my life. It's your life. Let's all bow our heads if we could. I'm just going to ask a moment. You can stay still just for a few minutes, if you don't mind, a few moments. Let's take an opportunity. Maybe, I don't know where you are, but maybe you've never given your life to Jesus. You believe in Jesus. You heard about Jesus. You can even quote scripture. You can sing the song, but you've never completely given your entire life. If you have not given your entire life, you've not given your life to Christ. God does not have second place. He's either the Lord of all or the Lord of nothing. And if you've not made a decision to give your life completely to God, then you're probably not a believer. You're probably not saved. That's how it works. You have to give it your whole entire life. And my friends, that's the way it works the best because God knows what's best. So if you would like to give your life to Christ today anew, maybe you've walked away, maybe you've never done it. Let's just pray a prayer right now. You pray this prayer with your heart. It's your heart connecting to the, your mouth that God will hear. It's that simple. I'm going to pray in your own heart. Lord Jesus, I believe you are the Son of God. I believe you died on the cross to pay for the sins of the world and my sins. I ask you right now to forgive me of all of my sins. All the sins I'm aware of, the sins I'm not aware of. And this day I declare, I lay down my life. I am no longer the boss. I declare that you are the new boss. You're the owner of my life. I am not. I hand over the keys to you. Take my life. It is yours. 
I submit myself to you. Fill me with your love, your peace, in Jesus' name. And with your help, I will follow you all of my days. With every head bow, I'm going to pray for you right now. Lord God, I pray for those right now that have prayed that prayer. I ask right now that you touch them, that you'd encourage them in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. I just ask real quickly, if you say, Pastor, that was me today. Can I just see you? Quick show of hands. Real quick. You say, I prayed that prayer. Thank you. Anyone else that say, um, thank you very much for, for being honest. Anyone else this morning? Thank you for being honest. Thank you for being honest. That's awesome. Come on, church. Let's thank God. They're making decisions for Jesus. We pray for the rest of you. Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you. You have not left us as orphans, but you've given us the Holy Spirit. Lord, you have not left, left us by ourselves. that every person has a reason why they're alive. And Lord, we just pray that we would hear your voice, but Lord, by listening, knowing your sovereign will, knowing your moral will, knowing the word. Father, I pray that we'd hear your voice and walk in it in Jesus' name. Lord, I pray for clarity right now in our hearts. If people need to make decisions about where to go to school and who to marry and what to go on with their finances, what to do about moving or not moving, Lord, we're just thanking you as we're faithful in the little. You, you'll help us to understand it in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to ask you all to stand if you could at this time. And we're going to ask the, the prayer team to make their way down. If you need prayer for anything at all, we want to pray with you. Listen, we're all in this together. Amen? Let's go ahead and do that. made a prayer today and you've given your life to Christ and I encourage you to share with someone today and we're going to continue to leave the um, front here open if you need prayer for anything at all we want to pray with you listen we're all in this together the Bible says there are two or three gathered in my name I'm in the midst of them there's power in coming in agreement together so otherwise uh, go to 201 today it's a little house over there